Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome. Um, as we start the meeting, I wonder whether you will be good enough to join me in a two-minute silence for our late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, uh, and then uh, we can feel that duty has been fully done and we're not showing any disrespect to our beloved monarch. Thanks very much. So if I start that in my house. Thank you very much. Well, <coughs> as I guess some of you will know that for my sins, which are considerable, I'm currently the chairman of the League of Friends of the former Edward Hayne Memorial Hospital. Um, I have with you tonight Simon Ryan, who is our facilitator for this project, uh, our secretary, Lynn Isaacs, um, who's done a fantastic job. Um, Annie, who is my Annie, who is my deputy chair, and uh, Donna, who is our fundraising <coughs> team leader, who's who's done a staggering job to date. Everybody has. So they're all going to explain uh, their own positions. And this is basically the first time uh, that we have been able to start operating in a normal way, coming out to the public, talking to you because we are now sort of formally in a position to complete the negotiations to purchase the Edward Hay for the community of St. Ives. So without further ado, I'll um, pass over to, uh, to Lee. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, good evening, everyone. I echo Tony's thanks to all of you for coming here tonight. Um, I'm going to a lot of what I'm about to say will be well known to many of you, but I thought this was a good opportunity to put into context where we are today as a campaigning group. <clears throat> as you know, the Friends are currently campaigning and fundraising to complete the purchase of the Hayne Hospital site from NHS Property Services. I'm actually really excited to say to complete because until a few weeks ago we were still in negotiation and now we're nearly there. Our vision is to create a health and well-being centre for the people of St. Our campaigners have massive support from all sectors of the whole local community and further afield and there are lots of fundraising activities to come in the months ahead. We're supported by several descendants of Sir Edward and Lady Hayne, including Kit Hayne, a great granddaughter, <coughs> who is actively involved on our committee, even though she lives in Pennsylvania, as you would say. The wonders of the internet. You see, our tentacles are all quiet. Closer to home, Kit's brother Tim and a cousin Jerry O'Reardon are also fully in support and work closely with us. Joey was able to come down last week at very short notice to our press launch, which was fantastic. So, our story is also <coughs> your story. It's a story about community, about people coming together to fight against all the odds, to fight for the services they want for their time about the power of our community to achieve the goal they've set themselves. Some of what I'm about to say, a lot of you will know. It is history, but I think it gives a context. In order to understand the passion and support in St. Ives of this hospital, we need to go back and look at its place in history and the tragic event that led to its creation. The name Payne is well known in St. Ives and can be traced back through local records to the first Elizabethan age. By the late 1800s, the Hayne Steamship Company, founded by Sir Edward Payne, had become hugely successful and the company were keen benefactors to the local community. Their family home was the Manor House, Trillow Manor, 
built in 1892. So Edward and his wife Lady Catherine had three children, two girls and a boy, also Edward known as Teddy. Tragedy struck the family on the 11th of November 1915 when Captain Teddy Hayne was killed at Gallipoli during the Dardanelles campaign of the First World War. It is said that Sir Edmund never recovered from the loss of his only son and heir. In 1916, a year after Captain Hayne's death, the annual report of the Hayne Steamship Company states that several shareholders wish to provide a worthy memorial to perpetuate the name and memory of the late director, Captain Edward Hayne. After various options were considered, <coughs> the board decided on the erection and equipment of a hospital at St. Ives to be named the Edward Hayne Memorial Hospital. Its original intention was the provision that provision be made for injured and dying of sea. However, this was all put on hold until the end of the First World War, when Albany House and Grounds came up for sale. This was purchased and the hospital was finally opened on April the 8th, 1920 by Lady Payne. So, St. Ives had its own hospital which served the local community well. Fast forward to 1948, when the hospital was taken over by the new reformed National Health Service but continued to serve the whole community. Along the way, it gathered the admiration and respect of all who had contact with it. Ask almost anyone locally about the hospital, and they will have a tale to tell about a family member or friend who received group care and treatment. Fast forward again to 1997, when the Health Authority decided on a three-month review with the serious consideration of closing the hospital. <coughs> well, St. Ives wasn't prepared to let that happen, so a campaign of objection began. Letter writing, petitions, public meeting, and a save our hospital march from Chicago Castle down to the harbour for a rally, with some people pushing the hospital bed. Not an easy task. After several months of delayed meetings and representations to the health minister, a reprieve was granted. Throughout all this, the legal friends have fought hard to fundraise with the support of the local community to keep the hospital open. Many people over the years have bequeathed their estates and money to the hospital, which is what allows us now to have a treasure chest to be able to go forward with the project. And we mustn't forget that. The prospect of the hospital closure raised its ugly head again in 2017 when the authority decided that the hospital, the hospital building was not fit for purpose on the grounds of health and safety. This was only a few months after the friends had invested £150,000 to build a new day room. The friends asked what the health and safety alterations would cost and offered to pay for them. <clears throat> After a long fight with the health authority who kept up in the cost, <coughs> the beds were closed and a consultation process began. In October 2017, the Friends organised an event which was called Hands Across the Heart. Many of you have been there. We called on the community to assemble along the harbour front wearing dressing gowns. This was to represent the 417 patients who could have been treated since the time of the closure. In the event, far more people turned on, and it was quite a spectacle. A special song composed for the event by Kit and Tim Payne was performed live by teams with everyone joining in the chorus. It was quite an event and had a lot of coverage. However, even this show of support failed to impress the health of in 2019, the Friends worked in partnership with Age UK to provide respite daycare for the elderly, which was very successful. Meanwhile, the consultation dragged on 
over nearly two years and finally concluded that the hospital should be closed, with the outpatient services limping on until early this year. When we finally learned that the building was, up, was to be put up for sale, we went to St. Mary's Town Council and asked for their support through this process. They unanimously agreed and have been negotiating on our behalf, for which we give them huge thanks. Their support was invaluable to the position we are in now. That is, we have an agreed price and the property is subject to contract. With our press launch last week, we were finally able to go public about this exciting news and thank you to everyone who came along to support us. <coughs> we have engaged professionals to advise us and have a business plan for how the building will work. We still have a way to go, but we're determined that we can provide the health and well-being services that this community wants and needs. Many people have been involved in this process and I'd like to pay tribute to the fabulous Friends Committee for their unwavering belief that our aim can be achieved. Thank you also to our brilliant fundraising team who organised so many innovative ways to extract cash from the community. <laughs> but my thanks most of all, of course, is the St. Ives community that has backed us in a way that was quite humble. They get what we want to do and are fully behind us. You are brilliant. Never underestimate the power of people working together. We're nearly there and we can do this now. Thank you. Silent, which for a newspaper man is extremely hard, which we really appreciate in my case, is simply because the only authority that could have negotiated under the terms was originally the um, town council, who didn't have the money to do it. And so that did require a lot of trust in us, and indeed a lot of confidence in the community to, to stick them out the way they did. Um, but eventually, um, the, uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, NHS Property Services uh, realised that we were doing it, so they formally recognised the effort. And I think our MP Derek had a lot to do with that. Um, so, in a strange way, we've pushed from the roots, and the government has pushed from the top. Um, and that's why we're here today. The Mayor, Kirsty Arthur, couldn't be with us tonight because of the restrictions that um, surround um, the civic authorities, civic, civic life during this period of mourning to the Queen. But she sent a message which um, I'd like to read to you. And this is what she says. As you may know, during the official period of mourning for our late Queen, all council business is suspended until after the funeral. Um, I would uh, so have liked to attend this meeting in person but a short note we'll have to do now for now. I just wanted to take the opportunity to congratulate you all on what has been years and years of physical and emotional hard work. When we gathered on Wednesday outside the building, we could feel the collective joy that rang out amongst the crowd. There, and later through the press and on social media, I am so proud to see this battle at one for the town and that it is down to all of you and your sheer determination and the stubbornness for fighting for all that we knew was right. I have false faith that we can raise the extra 70,000 with ease and I would hope it won't be long until we can gather again to commemorate the reopening of the building. In whatever guise, knowing the road that, is, has, know that, the road that has been taken has been a long to get there. Um, all my supporters are always Kirsty Arthur, Mayor of St Ives. Um, there are a few councillors here tonight 
They're not breaking any um, protocols. They're here in their private capacity. I would imagine. <laughs> and, uh, so over to Simon, and he, he will tell you. Um, <coughs> Tony. Hello folks. You probably all know each other, nobody knows me. My name's Simon Ryan. I'm from Corsand, the other end of the county. Um, I'm here largely because my community is suffering or struggling with the same kind of issues as yours. Very beautiful, very popular tourist area, second homes and holiday homes just past 60%. The usual complications with housing and with the loss of community buildings. Some of us got together and decided to try and push back. This is our first effort. This is a building in the village of Millbrook that we bought using community shares, local people's money. It's a community hub now. There's 40 volunteers. It's open every day of the week. We run a library, a micro, an art school, a post office, a computer centre, a whole range of things. It's been tremendously successful. It's provided a focus in the village, and I think that's the reason that slide is up there. It says something about yourselves, perhaps. That's 2014 we started, not that long ago. That's gone terribly well. That, this is the sort of building I normally get involved with. I don't normally get involved with buying hospitals. This is the old pub, the ship in in Corsan. This is what we bought for a quarter million quid. It requires a bit of work. <laughs> At one point, we were actually running events in there. It was considered the healthiest pub in Cornwall because it's loads of fresh air and no beer. <laughs> right. um, we've actually moved on a great deal. We've raised the field thousand pounds. We've built out the ground floor. It's now a flourishing community cafe, and there is indeed beer in there. There's going to be four flats, two of the main, two two beds, and two ones at the side. Again, community support, community investment is what made it happen. There's a message there which you understand perfectly. Who are these people? <laughs> Where's my third slide? What do you like? <coughs> Techies. Um, there. This is the work units. This is the back of the building that you just saw. Government money to build workspace, six units, that's the opening day actually. 20 square metres, they're small, they've never been out of use, we've had one one month void, people want them, they want workspace, they want activity space. Again, there's a message here for yourselves. That's my background, this is where I've been. The trust that I still work in part time now has five houses, six work units, a cafe and pub, a community centre, and we're going to build more housing soon. The, the thing that matters to me and to my group of people there is that if we work together, we actually can do this. In the very same way that there's been a belief in this town all this time, this could be done. <clears throat> we believed it could be done, and we've now shown it's possible. And in the course of that, process, I myself have learned the skills that have brought me here today to talk to you. Because my job is the back office stuff. I do the paperwork, the technicals, the talking, I'm good at that, and the finance. All right? I'll get onto that in a minute, but I just wanted to finish off. My community is extraordinary. People really care. And I've worked all over the place. And I'll tell you something. I have never seen the level of support that I see in St. Ives. I've never seen a community so strong, so committed. It's not just that you're great, you are extraordinary. You are really quite something, and I salute you, it's, it's astounding. You can come again. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I might do that, I'll come and tell you. Okay, um, my role, my, my um, value to you, is the technical material. First of all, legal structures. The Friends is a small charity and it's there to raise money to support hospital. Their legal structure, their operation is not suited to buying and owning and managing a large building. You have to create a new charitable company which can do that. You have to have a new board of trustees, a new set of governance. You have to understand accounts and finance. It's a big, big process. 
the legal structure is critical, I was able to help with that. The purchase deal, Tony's mentioned it, had to go through the town council, who have been brilliant. Everyone from the clerk to the mayor and the councillors have put their backs into this. And no benefits to themselves, benefits to the town, of course. Fantastic. NHS Property Services are probably the most difficult organisation I've ever dealt with in nearly 20 years. It's been tricky. There's some smiles here, but boy, there were some tears before. Yeah. It's nearly done. Um, they have agreed. There is a price. There is a deadline. They want it sold in the month of November. Is that realistic? Not sure yet, probably. They said 1st of November, that's not that <laughs> Month of November. All right? The finance. Lynn alluded to it. Over the decades, the Friends have raised substantial money. Donna and the team have then added a great big chunk more. What I did, very easy for me, I took that to the lenders, specialist charity lenders that said, here's the deal, here's the community, here's the value, this is what they've got, lend us the difference. And they went, oh, okay, bam, the gap, the remaining gap is the 70,000 that you know about. That gap needs to be filled to complete a picture which will be a long-term mortgage which is repayable from the business plan. How about that? Because we've studied usage in depth. I'm talking to higher NHS directors about reopening the Edward Hayne for the use of the NHS. Okay, I don't know why they sell it. Whatever. I think there's going to be NHS commissions in that building fairly soon. There's certainly going to be a wide range of health and well-being organisations using that centre, providing value for the local community. That's clear. The interest is enormous. You have to do the numbers. You've got a loan to pay, you've got insurance, you've got staff, you've got high costs. There has to be a good business plan, which another colleague wrote was with me, really solid, everything listed out. What's it going to cost? What are the risks? How will all that work? It's all done, it's there. Staffing. The Friends, as volunteers, have done astonishing things. You can't run a large building on volunteers. It's just not possible. You must have a full-time manager with admin support, paid for by the business building, by the business. That's all coming. The recruitment package is on the way. We'll have that in the next couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Four weeks. Um, the building itself, one of the interesting things I'm able to pitch to the NHS is that that building is completely compliant with the highest NHS protocols because they're still running it. The maintenance engineer still comes every week. The heating is still on. That's an NHS building. What the task of the new group is, is to maintain that level of protocol, that level of service, so the building is usable for all those people. Every one of those things has to be right or this project will not work. The reason I'm here is to reassure anybody who needs it that every one of those things is right. A couple need to be completed. There's legal documents, there's the legal process, that's all fine. But the system has worked, the structures are in place. This community is going to buy that building and it is going to work for you permanently as your building that this community owns. And I salute you for it. Fantastic, thank you. It is an interesting situation where we kind of always knew that the building was okay and that the management of the NHS was just simply wanting to get into it because they worked up to the job. Um, and um, as Simon says, the NHS property services have been keeping it, they have been maintaining it. Um, and the pain project, which was allowed to, was given an extension, did give us a pretty firm blueprint 
of what should be done and, and what is acceptable. Um, so there are other matters which Annie's going to talk to you about in terms of future usage and the sort of things you hope to put in. So over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, and particular thanks to people who've been really generous with their time and with their donations to the fund so far. Really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the consultation that I'm sure a lot of you responded to for us back in March. Um, we had about 500 respondents. Um, there were a set of closed questions um, on the front of the form. Um, Steve, is that is the other slide going? The closed questions, the slide that more Smashing, thank you. So this is the closed set of closed questions that you might remember. Um, 428 responses, it says there. I think we then collated about another 80 that came in through the email directly after the cut-off point. Um, so this was the set of closed questions regarding mainly individual space um, for health and well-being, GPs. Um, the fourth bar down says about the community facilities proposed such as Pat Bay and the very bottom one is talking about um, provision of decent rented housing for over NHS staff. So those are the tick boxes, yes or no, that we have the opportunity to fill in. And then could we go back to that other bar chart please? This one is a summary, it's the best I could do to try and summarise the over 500 ideas that came in in the free text box that was on the back, I think, of that consultation document. I'm not sure how much you can see of that. And I've got lots of copies here. People want to go, want to have a better look at what we've got in terms of, um, you know, have a closer look at that to take away. You can have one of those follow me at the end. Um, the majority of free text comments came in saying, look, what we would like to have back in the town is more NHS clinic services. Um, so that can really cover lots of different things. X-rays more locally, um, cancer treatments look more locally, um, blood testing more locally. That was the majority um, of respondents asked for that kind of thing. The next largest category was people suggesting day centre facilities, and that's what home is about with the winter project that yeah. the AGK was for yeah. running. Um, so those sorts of <coughs> facilities where people are able to come, socialise, have a decent meal, perhaps have a bath, um, perhaps have their nails done. Um, at mobility exercises was, was one of the main things. We forget that as we get older it's kind of like harder to meet them. But very simple exercises can make a difference. So that was quite an impressive piece of research. And the other thing was that, that they identified was that the team uh, there was actually having to go out and find people. <coughs> the doctors weren't referring people. Uh, and they were by word of mouth, a friend would say, oh, my friend, that's to do with good health. And they were going and finding that was the case because so many people didn't really want to come out and talk about it. So that's, yeah. is, there is so I much to do. I think once people were there, they were keen to come back. And I think yeah. sometimes yes. we suffer from yeah. short termism, don't we, projects yeah. where the professionals who are referring in don't always have the knowledge of what's available. Projects have to then get renewed after six months and so on. So yeah. with a sustainable provision, I'm sure that all the users will be There was one very specific case. Um, which sticks in my mind and happened at the time. Um, a lady had a fall. She was suspected of breaking her legs. Uh, her, her leg, sorry. Um, uh, but she hadn't. Actually, it might have been a shoulder. I can't remember which it was. Um, but because of the fall, she lost all confidence in walk walking. So they shipped her up to this garden school. And she was there for several weeks filling up the bed, where all she needed to do was be somewhere in a place where someone was there to help regain her confidence in walking. Um, things like that are becoming major issues now for the NHS, because they've got So we're seeing these things, <coughs> I 
should say at this point, I'm um, actually an occupational therapist. I do work for the NHS. I've worked for more than about 20 years. So I'm sort of, these sorts of things that we're thinking about are happening every day. And we all know stories amongst ourselves and friends and loved ones and family, you know, family members who've struggled um, with the lack of community services. I'm going to just jump back to this because I know we haven't got a huge amount of time. The, one of the other major needs in the town was mental health services, and that came out as probably the third highest single suggestion amongst our uh, consultees. And of course, mental health services means a lot of things. It could be work with people with dementia, with young adults, um, children with mental health difficulties, we've all come out of COVID, so we be less confident than when we went in in a lot of ways. Um, so I think, we, again, mental health services is a, an issue that we all find um, close to our hearts. One of the other large groups um, that people were suggesting, one of the large, large number of respondents suggested children and families facilities. So that could be childcare, it could be um, nursery, it could be an area where people can come and work but have a crash there with trained childcare workers. That was something that came up quite high. Um, and people did mention residential respite facilities. Um, and of course the NHS closed the hospital because of fire regulations. We we're unlikely realistically to really see beds back in the form that we are used to seeing them. On the other hand, um, there's nothing to say that if the building was changed and adapted, if there was found a space made available, residential and particularly the emergency respite, which is what a lot of my social work needs um, have said is really lacking down here, sort of short-term respite and emergency respite facilities in whatever form. Um, a lot of other people mentioned complementary and alternative therapies, so they can be therapies that were perhaps considered a bit outlandish sometimes. Osteopathy has now been accepted um, by the NHS and the NICE guidelines recommend that. Um, other kinds of therapies that people um, find beneficial, massage and so on, people were mentioning those, art therapies, music therapy and so on. Um, food share and cafe was mentioned by several people as well. And of course we've got the amazing orchard project um, that's happening at the top of town now, um, which is an amazing project, really innovative, and they've secured funding for a new build on their site. So we're really looking to partner with these organisations that have social interests at the heart and the community interest at heart. We're also aware that we will be we need to be transparent and as Simon said we need to be carefully looking at the governance of the new project because we want to ensure that we are self-supporting and creating a sustainable project that's going to pay for itself. So a lot of our services that we we're dreaming of providing we would love them to be free, we would love most of them and all of them to be free or at least subsidised, but I think we're going to need to recognise that we're going to have to entertain and welcome private business at times, but we want those private businesses to be businesses <coughs> that have community interests at their heart. We know that people are really struggling with dentistry in the town, that came out and um, was mentioned by quite a few of our respondents, and of course that's not a service that's free um, in any case. So we will need to be careful with the this balance of public and private provision and, and with hopefully input and help from people with all different skill sets in the community who can decide you know, what, how we can best use the building. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for getting involved and I have more documentation and um, summaries of the outcomes of that consultation available here. And just to briefly mention that the next stage that we've been working on is some information for potential tenants of the building. And we have got some information for potential tenants here. And there's some over on the information and, and uh, raffle table over there. Thanks, Elizabeth. And we've got expressions of interest forms. So if you know anyone or any of your family or friends, business associates are interested, please contact us for an expression of interest form where you can let us know how you would, what your dreams would be for using the building so that we can help make it accessible to everybody, um, useful to everybody in the community. So thank you. Well, um, obviously, um, Donna's going to speak next, but after Donna, um, uh, you'll all be able to speak to all of us 
on any questions. But, I mean, we have questions up here, and then you can move around and you can talk to Annie if you like, and collect on if you know anybody who's interested um, in, uh, in being practically involved in the building. Um, I allowed myself to get distracted because one of the things I was going to say when Simon pointed out that the building has been kept in good condition. Um, but the closure of it uh, that was, really was a fundamental <coughs> lack of will from the Gurno uh, uh, Plus Health Partnership. Because the reason why we put the um, and friends, I wasn't with them at the time, but the reason why the friends put all that effort into getting the, the day room was that it was the only thing that um, the CQC, Quality Care Commission, said was lacking from the hospital. And I believe, I'm right in saying, they gave, gave the hospital a clean bill of health after that was, after that was opened. And then all of a sudden, that wasn't good enough for uh, the NHS. Um, uh, so I'll now pass you over to our absolutely outstanding fundraiser. <laughs> Very existent on the face of this planet. It puts me to shame. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I don't quite know how I've got to this place, but um, I came onto the committee about, I think, about six years ago because my mum, Maureen Humphreys, as, is the longest serving member on the committee, some 25 years, something like that. And she said to me, you have to come on because everybody else is dying. <laughs> <laughs> At 61, it's quite nice to be one of the youngest. <laughs> and we've been having meetings ever since I've been on, and the closure has taken place, and waiting to see what was happening, and um, the trustees were having a meeting, a meeting, a meeting. And finally, we had a meeting, a committee meeting in December um, last year, and we heard that they um, actually put the building up for sale on, I think it's called EPINS, yes. which is a government website, which means that only a government body would be able to buy that at that time. And if no government body came forward, then it could go on the open market. So we had, I think it's 90 days, we kind of had a window of 90 days to see whether we could even start this process. And so that night, Kit, um, I messaged Kit, who, who had been involved before, Annie and myself decided we would set up a Facebook group to just see what the interest was. So there were three of us. Now there are 3,000. Um, and the interest and people's just jumping on board was just incredible. We started fundraising at the end of January with a quiz, which raised something like £1,200. I'm not going to mention people's names because by mentioning people's names, I'm going to forget somebody. So I've decided I won't sort of give thanks to anybody individually because I will definitely forget someone. But we've done all sorts of things. And F, the act has really been quite heartwarming because sometimes you think in this day and age, is there the will and is there the appetite? But I would say virtually without exception, everybody I've come into contact with and everybody I've asked to help has helped. Businesses have come forward and run events, we've had quizzes, we've had toddle waddles at the nursery, we've had a ball, um, so many things. Um, and we've still got to that. Pardon? The quilt, yeah. The quilt <laughs> has been made for us and it's still rattling and there are tickets from Elizabeth, the pound each, please buy a ticket. Um, that was made by Needles and Pins, our local group, and it's absolutely beautiful. Hundreds of hours have gone into that, so it's fantastic. You know, the whole community has got involved, and it just goes to show how much the building means. But actually, I think buying the building is probably the easy bit. <laughs> I think we, we are going to need an army of volunteers to come forward. Um, and I would love it if you all went out and spread the word. Some people, we want people to come on the Friends Committee. We do need that. It's not a closed shop. We want people, we want some younger people to come on the committee. Um, 
but we also want people who perhaps don't want to be on the committee but will be on an email list that they might just come occasionally to help on a coffee morning or bake a cake. We, we need to sort of really network and if this is going to continue, once we've got the building, that's still, there's still a real big place for the fundraising alongside the business plan that goes ahead. It's almost going to be twofold. There are going to be like the Friends of Edward Hay, which will be the fundraising arm, and then the Edward Hay Centre, which will be the sort of management and business side. So we we really need we need to be looking for people who are very smart, kind of business people who perhaps can help us with the Edward Hay Centre, and people who can make a cake. You know, we want every, we do we we really want all of that. So um, we've had amazing things. We've got a lot of upcoming events. Um, hopefully we'll get them in the paper, we need to get things out. It's really getting our way out. Um, our upcoming events, we've got Cape Cornwall Singers in the Lifeboat Inn on the 7th of October. We have a fashion show at the Harbour Hotel on the 9th. Um, we have a coffee morning and cake stall at the Western on the 24th. Our online auction, which um, we raised over £9,000 for when we did one back in March. We've got one at the 28th of October through to the 6th of November. We've got a Christmas quiz coming up again at the Western Hotel. And we have the GoFundMe, which we just launched last week, which actually I've been really quite disappointed with. <laughs> so, um, I thought it would fly, and it's really quite slow. So we've deliberately, obviously, we launched it on Wednesday and then um, we lost the Queen on Thursday. So we sort of think we're going to just, we felt we should just sort of be back. But and next Tuesday, we will be going all guns blazing again. And, you know, we want people, if they can afford the price of a cup of coffee, to donate a cup of, the price of a cup of coffee. It's not just big donations. It's lots of small donations really help. And if you can't donate, please sort of share. You know, it's important to share. Um, all of these things. A lot of people are not online, so we have to try and get to these people as well. But anybody who can help in any way, we really, really want that. Um, we have donation buckets that will be outside on the way out, so if anybody's got any spare change, that would be very, very grateful. Like I said, I seem to have spent the last nine months just asking. <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting quite good at begging. <laughs> and it's fine, I don't mind begging for that. Um, just, I did say I wasn't going to mention anybody, but by fortune, we have a gentleman here in the audience who is native from St. Ives called Colin Dunn, and he now lives in London, but <coughs> he's down here for a few days, and I'd like to invite Colin onto the stage to tell us what happened a couple of days ago. Oh, <laughs> I went to the infants and the juniors. Then on to the bedroom. And uh, when I got to 23, it was time to move to pasture as a new company industrial and gypsy. But before I did move, I used to help and support my father, who was the head gardener at Trigana Castle. He had 19 people working under him back in the late 50s. And I used to walk with him from our house in Trelawney Road. To the castle, and we pass this building, and we'd also pass the wonderful house of Virginia Woolf. And I used to read her books to the lighthouse, and afterwards I'd go scrumping <laughs> in the orchard on Primrose Hill, uh, where there was a guy, James, I don't know, Madman. <laughs> And he had the best apples in St. Ives. You know what I mean? But if he caught you, he would he'd be like Freddy Krueger. Uh, but so that little area around there, Primrose Hill, going down to the beach, you know, the little uh, crossing green and all of that, very fond. When I moved to London, um, I very much stayed in contact with some of the people that I grew up with. And I used to come back to uh, St. Ives three or four times a year. In fact, a couple of the people in the street didn't even know I'd left. <laughs> so when I'd come down after three months, they'd go, I haven't seen you for a while, boy. <laughs> Where have you been? I said, oh, I just went up to London. 
which is really strange. But fast forward, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, in London, I got into the whiskey business, uh, not illegal, um, and uh, also London's the kind of place where if you've got a, an opportunity to take up a hobby, uh, you can. And I always fancy myself as a singer in a rhythm and blues band. And I failed miserably, but I managed to meet a guy called Tim Hain. And we formed a band called The Lag of Villains. And our sound is like four flat tires on a muddy road. <laughs> kind of like a cross between C16 and ZZ Top, if you know who they are. Um, and we would do gigs, and uh, they were fantastic. And one day I mentioned to him about the Edward Hain Hospital, because my father at one point was taken in there. And he, he said to me that the people who looked after him in there are like the sons of the earth. Real community down here. And um, he said, oh, I'm connected. You know, we've got a lot in common. My God, I believe it's ours. And the awfully bad singer, we have the same thing in common. And I remember um, the thing you talked about, the hands across the harbour and all of that, I watched it on the news. And Tim and I are really good friends. So I get to the point, I heard about the fundraiser and I said, listen, let's see if I can contribute, whether it's a penny, a pound, or whatever. So I organised an evening with this. Um, place in Hammersmith in West London where they've got a whiskey club with 200 members and I thought you know some of these London people they've got the cash do you know what I mean <laughs> and uh, I, thought, I, put, the bonuses. I thought I put um, I put up some of my own bottles I've got a uh, whiskey's very collectible now it's like a Rolex or a fine wine um, they're very very collectible and um, so I thought I'm going to put up some of my bottles I'm going to offer on the night a personal tasting with yours truly um, in your house for eight people <coughs> and uh, within a 20 mile radius of London and two people paid three thousand pounds each for the privilege of me gabbing to them <laughs> can you believe that and I put up one of my bottles a rare bottle and I thought, that might get a couple of hundred pounds. 2,300. God, what's going on here? So to summarise it, you know, with the ticket sales, we've got 55 people paying 65 quid. We did a raffle, we did an auction, and at the end of the evening, when it was totaled up, it was 15,530. Whatever it is, it's fantastic. It's not me, it's for the cause. You know, uh, with Tim on stage and everything, between the pair of us, we had an absolutely fantastic evening. I then prayed and hoped that the 15,530 pounds would materialize. <laughs> and it's in the bank. You know, with a little bit of chasing up. So, as it turns out, I've not come down here to stand up here to seek any adulation. I'm down here for a bereavement, go back to London tomorrow, but I was asked whether I wanted to come along, and I wanted to, to see anyway, you know, what strength in this great town has for this architectural building. So here I am, that's enough of me, back to the committee, thank you for this time. Thank you um, very, uh, very much indeed, Colin. Uh, two things I've learned being on Friends. The power of cakes <laughs> and now the power of whiskey. <laughs> um, well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we're um, open for any questions, anything you'd like to ask any of us. I don't know whether we want to circulate off the stage or whether somebody wants to have a rope or oh, Elizabeth is there with a roaming mic. Ah, there's a chat. I have no idea what I'm doing. So somebody with a hand up at the back there. Oh right.
Um, I'm working with West Cornwall Health Watch, which some of you will have heard of. We've been a, a protest group, really, for a number of years, and I'm fairly new to it. One of the things that's been on our minds is to find a good way of supporting this project, while also realising that we are a protest group, not a support group, in that sense. So if anything we can do, then please ask. I've said that already to a number of members of the team. But I think one of the things, from my perspective, as a former healthcare professional, that I want to reflect is the complete disjunction between one group and another. Simple example, how many new GPs were we promised by year 2024? Was it 6,000? It takes eight years to train a GP, and that promise was made three years ago. There's no connection between proper planning and the kinds of services we want to see. And you get that at every level, where the immediate focus is on the immediate issue. We can't afford to keep this going, we must sell it. Not what use could it be made of. And the consequence of that was it was nearly lost to the community. And now the new integrated care bill wants to use it. I mean, it's an absolute contradiction. So I'm personally very much behind this campaign. I want to see it succeed. Very willing to do anything I can to help it succeed. But I would passionately say to everybody in this room, if you can help in any way, please do. The things they want to put on, things that came out of that survey, are absolutely brilliant. And they accord very much with the stated aims of the new integrated care services as expressed by the Integrated Care Board back in June. So it's totally in line with what the NHS wants to do, and yet five years ago they nearly solved the problem. Do you know, there's, it, it beggars belief in my mind that the NHS can be so disjointed, but it is. It needs, it needs to be able to deal with the important and get out of the habit of dealing just with the urgent. There's lots of urgent things to do, but that has to be focused on the important. That's my two pounds. Thank Thanks very much. I would like to see a situation where by the management of the Edward Hain Hospital is a very, very, very limited input by the NHS itself. Um, they could very well be muddying waters for the future and spoiling any logical and well thought out plans without that. So, um, you know, I believe that uh, any support out there would be great. Well, let's keep them out of the management. Yes, certainly. I'd just like to respond on that one and on the previous speaker as well. Something extraordinarily interesting is happening about community ownership of what was previously public property like the NHS and others. It turns out that tiny organisations like the Edward Hayne Charity can do a better job of owning, controlling and managing local services and local facilities and the NHS can slipstream behind and do the thing they do really well. It's very weird that a small organisation of volunteers can run a big building that enables the NHS to restart. That point is critical. This building is now yours. There's no earthly reason that should ever change. The NHS will not be involved in the management because the community own it and run it. The NHS get priority for using it, of course. There's a very peculiar new model emerging. Your community is at the forefront of that, and it's really very interesting. I think I'd, I think I'd quite like to respond to that, um, Simon, from the perspective where I came from. If we think about what we have in St. Ives, had in the past lost, in the case of every day for the NHS, if we think about what we have in St. Ives, which is extraordinary, um, it has all come from the roots up, not from the top down. Uh, kids are austere to here, from the roots up. Um, Tate Gallery, from the roots up. Stenant Surgery, from the roots up. All of these things had to be fought for and were eventually achieved by the community. Um, we're not so good when people up the line, London usually, 
Westminster try to tell us what to do and how to do to be well. This business about the integrated care services, which now appears to be beginning to happen, for the reasons that you said, uh, I remember going to consultations 20 years ago where they were saying that that was going to happen. And I went to a consultation about six or seven years ago at the beginning of the Shape of the Future um, the debates where they said the same thing that they'd said 15 years previously. And I said, oh, I thought you'd done that. No, it's only now beginning to happen and it's beginning to happen because it's coming from the roots up. And hopefully, on the strength of the projects we've seen in St. Ives, um, uh, we will be able to have a project which isn't just saving the hospital, which won't just be a really good community health and welfare centre, but will also be an exemplar for the rest of the country, because most of the things we've done before have become that. I remember after the Tate Open, we were inundated by other communities saying, how can, we do, how can we do this? We didn't give them much advice, because outside of St. Ives, it's not something that you can do easily. But in St. Ives, from the roots up, we all have a very good chance of achieving something really great. Thanks very much. Sorry, that was just... I think going on from what Tony just said to point Simon, we, the people, will be the custodians of the Heverdane Wellbeing Clinic, not the NHS. I think we have to make that very clear. We should be the employers, the people, not the NHS. Good evening, uh, Andrew Mitchell. Uh, firstly, let me say thank you to you. You have all done a fantastic job. Not just yourselves now, not just the friends, the local committee now, all those people who helped you, but those over the decades who have lived, quite rightly so, amass this war chest. Um, this pot that was given so freely, um, but hard fought for and worked for. So congratulations to all of you. Um, Mr. Judkins um, hit it on the head. We are seeing the systematic dismantling and disappearance of the National Health Service. Uh, and that started over in Penzance. We then had it in some times. And, and the reason, the arguments, um, you know, and not only did the uh, Quality Care Commission, after the friends spent £150,000, say, that's it, great, brilliant. Our own fire service, who inspected it, said the building's fine then all of a sudden, the doors aren't wide enough. How much will it cost to widen the doors? £150,000. Fine, we'll write you a cheque. Oh no, sorry, we made a mistake. It's £300,000. Fine, we'll write you a cheque. Ah, no, we got it completely wrong. It's £600,000. Well, okay, we probably want a few guarantees, but we've got that money, thanks to you guys. Oh, hang on. No, I've got it completely wrong. It's £1.2 million to widen doors. How bloody ridiculous. <laughs> but that was their excuse. They stuck to it. It wasn't closed for those five years, by the way. It was just mothballed. Which, again, is total and utter rubbish. Um, now, you said to uh, um, the... We're going to get the 70,000, there's no doubt in my mind, sometime in November. That will be very dreadful, even like yesterday. And then those bills, which are currently being paid for by property services, will actually fall on somebody local. And um, that is a concern, and you're absolutely spot on. The easiest bit, and it wasn't easy, but the easiest bit was buying the building. Coming up with those, that business plan, making it happen, the great um, input which will happen and continue, but you do need to get a business plan, be more business-like. Now you will have a lot of organisations who will go, yeah, you've done a brilliant job, you saved it, and we'd like to hire it and pay maybe 30 quid a day, and things like that. You cannot let that happen. You cannot. 
And if the NHS, NHS want to hire rooms, great. They need to pay a market price. You need to get as long a contract out of them as possible because budgets come, budgets go, and they disappear. And they might be funded one service for a couple of years, and they'll go, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll rent the room, we'll pay you this, and then they'll be going, we wish to give you notice. So we need, really need to get that business plan. And I'm just, and maybe tonight's not the night to do it, but you know, when are the first, what, what needs to be done immediately to actually give somebody a set of keys, sign a lease and say, thank you, we're moving in on the 1st of November. Because we've now got end of November, when it is ours. Those bills will soon mount up and they will soon hit somebody's desk locally. So, um, you know, it's great. Um, I, I hope the town council, because you didn't get any help from Cornwall Council. I was absolutely appalled at the way the uh, scrutiny committee didn't support sometimes with the open uh, it, It's a real shame, I think, on Cornwall Council. But use the, the town council as well. We're here to help. And we want to make sure this happens. But if you have got a moment, the business plan that I'm sure you've got in place and will be fantastic. Can you just give us some hints as to like when you're going to start getting rents and people are going to be moving in? Certainly, thank you. Buying the building, the exciting part is nearly over. The dull part begins. How much is a standard price for a one morning session for the NHS? It's the market price. They have a series of prices, a series of protocols. I'm talking to the head of strategy and finance or something. And they've basically said, if the service is needed, it'll be on our normal contract. And that's a lot of money. That side will not happen in November. They're a very slow organization. It'll probably happen in January or February, okay? Other organisations are fleeter and faster and more in need. We've been talking to Age UK, some other big ones have been mentioned tonight. They're gagging to get in there and start work. If we say 15th of November, they'll be there. We won't. We have to take away the notices, put up some new notices, check the electrics. Realistically, we're probably talking January. All right? That delay is in the business plan. A cushion of finance is included so that we can delay for a short period in order that the thing works properly. All right? There is a, what they call a ramp up. You start slow, you build steadily. What you don't want to do is take on every single potential applicant who might walk out for weeks. You have to do it right. But the plan works by providing that cushion and giving us the chance to go, I'm really sorry you're not high priority for us giving the chance for those who are to come in two weeks later. It's there. It's not ready for publication. It will be published because there's some confidential material, there's some contracting to go through. But there is a long document which will be available presently. Right. Thank you. I just quick um, to, to say congratulations and well done to the team. It was absolutely fantastic. Renee there, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, can I just ask a question? What, what condition is the building in, inside? Um, I know I've been trying to get in for months, so as soon as let me in, so without touching, what, what, what condition is the building in? Well, Simon can answer that, but it's pretty damn good. The, um, one of the extraordinary, you saw the slide of the pub that we bought, which has, it's got some walls. That hospital, I, I promise you the heating is still on, the complete heating system was replaced two and a half years ago at the cost of £150,000. <laughs> after the decision to close was already run into the system. The joy of the NHS and their slightly bonkers arrangements is they've maintained absolutely everything to fully compliant protocol, servicing, inspections, the whole lot. It's as good as it could be. Amazing. Somebody else. Uh, hi, first of all, respect to you all up there. Thank you. I'm a Cornish local. I've got two questions, really. The first one was, during the discussions about the projected uses of the building, 
did ever the question of A and E services ever come up? I'm thinking of the huge tourist burden we have in the season, and I'm sure that must have been a consideration. And my second question is really very naive, but somehow I'm misunderstanding it. If this building was gifted to the town in 1920, how is it that we've had to buy it back? I still don't understand that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's so, if anyone wants to have a look, I've got these pie charts. Statistics, I can do statistics, but I can't do IT. So my lovely no. pie charts kept, no. came out in different shades of grey. Um, but I can send you the more detailed breakdown of the suggestions that people made. They did mention a minor injuries unit. We have got a minor injuries unit at Stenham. And my understanding is that there are two clinic rooms about to open at the Stenham that are level access, unlike the other clinic rooms at the Stenham, which are upstairs, which is brilliant. Um, and I think that minor injuries is potentially what you would get. You won't even, you don't really get, um, you don't get anaesthetic cover even at West Cornwall at night, which means it isn't what you would call A&E. So we do have to have that 50 mile round trip to Trillis for full, full A&E services, I believe. So yeah, it did come up having a minor injuries unit. Whether we can expand that, um, certainly it's something that we could go to the NHS um, hierarchy and discuss whether or not there's something we can provide. Um, we would need you know, properly fitted out clinic space and properly staffed um, space there. But so many of us, I think it'd be lovely to have a project where we talk to people who kids have got their heads stuck in the railings, a bead up their nose. You know, I've talked to so many people who've been up to yeah, the pain in my region is really when it was there. And I think it would make a really nice photographic storybook, really. But in terms of why why we've had to buy it back, I'm going to have to defer to it. Let me, can I, okay. I've, got, I've got to tell you a story about a field in Poor Sand Village, which is the exact replica. <coughs> in my village, there was a field, a field in the middle of the village, it's a flat field. It was owned by the community. The community paid to tarmac that field to create a car park for locals and visitors. It was raising money, it was working fine. For reasons no one can now remember, the car park got taken over by Cornwall Council, who mysteriously then started keeping the money. Seven years ago, Cornwall Council suggested that the community might like to buy the car park in order to keep the money. And everyone went, no. You buffoons, give us the car park back. It's gone no further. There's a, there's a moral and an ethical discussion to be had there, but there is no prospect of achieving anything. That's the sad truth. Can I, can I sorry, just, just quickly through you, uh, Chairman. Uh, um, so, all the cottage hospitals, every other hospital in the country, was actually absorbed into the NHS when it was created in 1947. Mm. So, didn't matter who, and I, I think some um, uh, gifts could have been written or worded better uh, where they would have remained the property of the local community, but Edward Hayne was absorbed into the National uh, Health Service. Uh, as far as the National Health Service, and more latterly, Property Services Limited, um, and as far as any lawyer, uh, solicitor, barrister, court would tell you, it was owned by the NHS, which means it's owned by the government. Uh, and when it came up for um, no longer being required for their use, it was going to be sold. Um, with the, the minor injuries, I mean, personally, I think that's quite valuable. I remember gashing my uh, finger with a scythe gardening one day and it was just a matter of you know holding it all together and walking down um, not so much to stitch it up but to get a tetanus jam because I hadn't had one um, I have this fantasy or I have this fantasy around G7 there is Joe Biden up at Tregenna Castle and he has a bad corn and he goes into an anaphylactic shop and he says, where, where, get, you know, adrenaline, give me adrenaline. And his security people say, oh God, Mr. President, 
we forgot to bring our adrenaline packs because the Brits don't have adrenaline packs when they go out hiking. They don't need it. And uh, but there's a hospital just down the road. They can give you your, your, they can give you your antihistamines. They can give you your steroids. And then somebody has to tell him. Probably Boris who on the 22nd of May 1919 stood at the War Memorial with me and Derek Thomas not being able to understand why they couldn't get the hospital reopened because he said, how much is it going to cost? And we told him and he said, that's a bit of money to raise and we said, we've got it. So he said, what's the problem? So even government was told it. He wasn't, he wasn't um, in government at the time, it was the run of the election. So the reason why the Joe Biden uh, fantasy came to me was because I went through exactly that problem. <coughs> My wife had something, um, eating in one of the St. Ives restaurants and started to go into, into anaphylactic shock. <coughs> Whether it was a, a peanut or anything, she's not specifically uh, an allergy for anything. What was the solution? Into a taxi, up to the end of pain, steroid, antihistamine, problem solved. Think about that condition where your start, throat starts to swell and you can't breathe, having to go all the way up to Tura. You know, probably it would have been a matter of trying to get a paramedic. But those sort of things can happen. We were lucky we only knew about that because my son had been through it as a kid, having managed to get stung by a swarm of wasps. And, uh, and then we realised that things were happening to him, wasps had his stomach. But yes, I mean, if we could do that, if we can get good initial first aid type A and E and uh, minor injuries working well in St. Ives. That would be, you know, we'd just be getting back to where we used to be. Right? Sorry for going on that. I just think that there's so many uses for the building and, and we have discussed as a committee that it should be prioritised for the full-time residents of St. Ives. I think they're the people we're the committee, but the community are the people that have got behind this and, and will own this. And so we really need to sort of focus on so many things and engage with so many different people and find out what they want. So, um, and, and it's the support. And I think if we do that and do that in the right way, we will keep the support. And that's what I think is key, really. Thank you. Thank you. Just add to that, we have got a community bus that I think the H UK funded that used to be parked. So even if we're talking about facilities that are really not economically possible to reopen the pain, at least if we've got some dedicated transportation that we can offer to the community, that's some, that's something you know. Does anybody remember or uh, recall that bus service? It used to. Um, what with the age of concern uh, centre, didn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, is it still around, do you know? Uh, I think we would. Yeah. I, I believe it is there. Hmm. Well, we'll look into that. Do we have any more questions? It's uh, interesting to note, um, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but for several years, West Cornwall Hospital has had a project to refurbish and enlarge its outpatient area and improve the facilities for the um, uh, minor injuries unit. That project is now on hold because promised government money has now been shelved for the time being. Whether it will ever come back is anybody's guess. Meanwhile, costs are rising. So the original £11 pound, million pounds will not provide the facilities that would have been provided a year ago. That is another disgrace for this community and makes the Edward Hayne Hospital even more important and especially thinking in terms of being able to handle minor injuries more effectively and more consistently in our own town than we get from West Cornwall Hospital. There are many things going on in the NHS that are going to make this kind of facility vital if only we're going to manage the short term. I would hope one of the things the NHS wants to do in that hospital is to provide decent outpatient support uh, and particularly perhaps even chemotherapy for support for cancer patients. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen like that. Or antibiotic services for those who need intravenous antibiotics for bone infections or things of that sort. There's lots they can do in that building. 
if they put their minds to it. But they're still in their silo mindset, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. And by the way, a huge thank you to the committee. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Uh, any, anybody else, or shall we now formally close the meeting, come off stage and just mix among you and talk to you as you want to ask questions? Before, before you uh, mix, was, is there anyone, I'm your captive audience, is there anyone that would like to give me their name and number that <coughs> could possibly help in the future? Maybe bake a cake, hold the microphone, <laughs> anything. That they, they don't actually want to be on the committee, but want to help. Could anybody try and pass it back? Alternative to that, if anybody's sort of on um, Facebook, they can message me with their email details. Because we'd like to sort of compile a list of people who would like to help as well. So that would be great. Thank you. Right, I've seen my bit now, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're always looking for any help, as you all have realised, but we're always desperate for tombola prizes and raffle prizes, so if, or even auction for the auction coming up, we are always desperate, and so you'll always see or hear one of us <coughs> asking, and we'll constantly keep asking, but please, if you can just ask your friends and neighbours, they're getting rid of anything, we'll have it, we're quite happy, we don't care what it is. I mean, Donna said that, was it to your neighbour? And then she ended up with an electric bike, so we don't care what it is, you know, electric bikes, cars, houses. I mean, Elizabeth and I did go into the estate agents, didn't we? We asked for a house, but they wouldn't give us. No, they didn't give us that house. They said, what can we give you? We said, well, we can we'll have a house. But we're still waiting for it, but anything we really don't mind. But a small donation of anything, we'd love it, or it's, and your help. If you want to just run a stall with us, or come and help by asking people to buy a raffle ticket, we'll, love, we'll just love you, we really <laughs> will. Thanks very much. I just want to say thank you to all you've done, it's been amazing. The, um, and I've watched from afar and I've you know, been involved with them a few donations. But more has just reminded me that on a week Sunday I'm winning a Bristol Half Marathon. And I want to raise money for Edward Hayes. Oh. Okay. I've been doing the practicing, so I'm ready, I'm ready for the run, but I haven't been ready for the fun. So I just started about a week or so ago for something. So if I connect with you, Donna, yeah, I'll please spread do. it around. I it on Facebook. Yeah. Do it. But I will also um, Put my name forward for help and then you can go on forward. I do not, not get cake, I don't get cake, so <laughs> <laughs> I do other things. I like the phone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. So I'll officially close the formal part of the meeting and please, if anybody wants to speak to any of us, we'll be down mingling below. Thank you all ever so much for coming and listening to us and spread the word. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.